Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is privacy. So I think the first thing we should talk about is why is privacy different in the digital age? What makes privacy uniquely interesting in a networked digital world? So I think there's a number of changes that have recently occurred that uh, heavily impact privacy. And so let's talk about some of these. There's a lot more information available for tracking. So, you know, almost everybody has a cell phone at this point and cell phones can track our movement. There's the obvious, which, uh, you know, as you, as you move the cell phone around, as you drive around the city, uh, your cell phone is contacting different cell towers and that can be used to track your movements. But it actually turns out that you have much finer grain tracking than just the cell towers in many situations. As your cell phone's moving around, um, it is also contacting different Wi-Fi networks and different Wi-Fi routers as you move about uh, an area. And it turns out those can also be used to track your movements. So just to provide an example, Nordstrom's has experiment with tracking how customers move from one part of their store to another by watching where cell phones uh, try to connect to different networks as they move around the store. Also, closed circuit television cameras are uh, all over the place now, um, and they can also be used to track where we go. The United Kingdom is estimated to have one closed circuit television for every 10 to 15 people. Um, technologies like Amazon's Ring doorbells with cameras also can be used to track movement, uh, particularly once you have a relatively large number of these in an area, um, then you can sort of put together the video coming from each of these different doorknobs in order to track movement. And later on, we'll be talking about how China is using closed circuit television to uh, track people as well. Also, as we move our consumption of media to digital devices, it makes it very simple to um, track our media consumption habits. So, you know, digital newspapers and magazines, digital books, digital TV shows and movies. As long as you are not using physical medium, you are instead using digital medium, um, it's super simple to track everything that you're viewing, everything you're reading, everything you're watching. Uh, these can be used by the government to determine your reliability. And in fact, uh, we'll see an example a little bit later on on how China may be using this for their social credit system uh, being used to determine the reliability of their citizens and giving them rewards or punishments on that basis. And I think the situation is liable to get worse, not better. Um, as we move to smart cars, which have some smart technology in them, and then we move to self-driving cars, it's going to be very easy to track your movements. Smart homes can provide information to whoever has access to them on uh, your activities in home. Um, and in fact, smart TVs, uh, which is pretty much most televisions that you would buy now that have some sort of a, I suppose I can call it an operating system. I think many of them are based on Android uh, built into them, which allows you to uh, select, put different applications on them and select different movies and watch different movies. Um, some of these companies are actually selling information about your viewing habits. So in addition to having all this information, we now have sufficient processing power to really take advantage of it. And this can also be combined with the ability to store uh, a lot of information and then run processing after the fact on it um, that gives us the ability to strip away things that were traditionally thought of as private. So Previously, let's say we were um, trying to track a particular vehicle across the city. Maybe somebody had been kidnapped. We had some sort of a hostage situation. The police could use the closed circuit television cameras that are available in some streets that are used to, tra uh, to look at traffic patterns. And they could say, oh, we're going to go ahead and watch the, uh, watch the hostage's uh, vehicle travel across the city. And so that's something they could do live before. But what we're able to do now or what we're, we're the direction we're moving in as uh, storage becomes cheaper and cheaper is to store all the information from all the traffic cameras and store it over a period of time. So, 
you know, the exact amount of time we would be able to save it would depend upon our storage capacity and how cheap storage gets. But you could certainly imagine a situation where um, you could store several days worth of traffic or, you know, at some point you may be able to store months worth of traffic and then process it later on. So, you know, maybe there's nothing going on right now, but then you're like, hey, so-and-so is, uh, you know, I, I think so-and-so is in a scandal. Let's go ahead and uh, dig up the tapes from three months ago. Um, here's his license plate number. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can search all of the data from all the traffic patterns to see if we can find his license plate number and then see what he's been up to. So, um, you know, I think the direction we're headed is potentially worrisome from a privacy standpoint. Um, and this combination of storing massive amounts of data and then being able to process it, um, this is what sometimes referred to as big data. And it's something that's available for both commercial users and government users. And it's something that we may want to think about, like, do we want to regulate this? What sort of society do we want? Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on lecture when we talk about both commercial issues with privacy and then government issues with privacy. Okay, so um, as far as US law goes, so it turns out that some of the protections afforded by US law are being eroded by our computing capabilities. Uh, for example, the Supreme Court has ruled that individuals have the right to practical obscurity. And so the way this played out, uh, or one example of how this played out is that requests for FBI rap sheets using the Freedom of Information Act were turned down on the basis of the need for practical obscurity. And while that information was publicly available, the idea is that um, somebody would have to go through and gather all that publicly available information, and that was a time-consuming thing. So um, those listed had practical obscurity because of the difficulty of tracking down all the information. But of course, now it's trivially easy to track down information, in fact, companies gather this information. You may have seen their advertisements on the web like, hey, do you want to look up what your high school significant other was doing? Look them up. Find out where they live now. Find out what their income is. Find out if they're married. Um, so the practical obscurity is uh, largely gone because of computing power. Um, the European community is probably doing the best job of uh, being active, trying to protect the privacy of their citizens. Um, there's been several things that they've done. One thing that they've done is that in 2014, the European Court of Justice ruled that in certain circumstances, its citizens had the right to be forgotten. And under this ruling, uh, search engines had to remove certain search results. So if a newspaper had an article that they had written previously, they were still allowed to leave that up on their um, website. But um, search engines couldn't directly link to those articles. Uh, within a half year of the court ruling uh, on the right to be forgotten, Google had received over 120,000 requests for deletion of information. Um, another move that the European community has made is the European General Data Protection Regulation. Um, and this uh, was agreed upon in 2016 and took place two years later. Um, you will most notice this because of the annoying uh, pop-ups that you're constantly getting whenever you visit a website saying, are you okay, star information. I mean, it turns out that California has also made similar moves uh, very recently. So uh, you may be getting some additional pop-ups because of California's new laws. Um, so what does the General Data Protection Regulation actually do? Well, here are the key things that the GDPR requires. Um, if a company is storing somebody's information and is breached, individuals must be notified within 72 hours of a breach. It's not unusual without this law, it's not unusual for a company to not even tell people that their data is out there or to wait as long as possible um, in spite of the fact that people knowing their data is out there might be an important thing for those people to be able to protect themselves. Um, GDPR requires all individuals whose information has been leaked to be notified within 72 hours. Individuals also have the right to access the information that the company is storing about them. Um, they have the right to have data removed about them. Um, and companies are reminded that they should have privacy designed into their products from the start. 
In addition, uh, companies that fit into certain characteristics must have data protection officers. Uh, and those data protection officers must report to the highest levels of management. Um, and they're responsible for making sure that the data is properly protected. Violations of the GDPR do have some teeth and they may require penalties as high as 4% of a company's worldwide revenues. All right, let's take a look at uh, commercial use of data. So one thing that privacy advocates sometimes talk about is this concept of you are either a customer or a product. And so this is basically saying there's no such thing as a free lunch. If you are using a product and you are not paying for it and you are not getting that uh, service from a nonprofit or perhaps the government, then the company that you are getting that service from needs to be making their money somehow. If you're paying for it, well, great. That's how they're making their money. If you're not paying for it, then probably they're making money by selling either access to you or information about you. So, um, you know, either directly they're taking information about you and selling it directly, or they are showing targeted advertising for to you. And unfortunately, it's now possible for you to both be a customer and also be a product. So just as an example, as of 2017, internet service providers can now sell information on your web browsing habits to others, even though you are actually paying them for your internet service. So should we be concerned? So, you know, one thing to be thinking is, hey, I use Google or I use Bing or I use, uh, I, I, I guess, DuckDuckGo. I can't think of any other services offhand um, as my search engine. And obviously they have to pay the bill. So um, seeing targeted advertisements because um, I'm able to use Google for free, that seems like a, a reasonable thing. Um, but the thing to be concerned about is where's the line and is that line enforced by custom or is it enforced by the law? And to give you sort of a classic scenario that privacy advocates have put out there, um, if I am searching websites looking for things about cancer, perhaps I have a friend who has cancer or a parent has cancer or I have cancer, there's no way they know, but is it okay for the search engine to take the information that I am searching for cancer, turn around and sell that information to my insurance provider and for my insurance provider to jack up my rates on the theory that I might actually have cancer. Are we okay with that? And how is it, if, if we're not okay with that, how is it gonna be enforced? All right, another thing that you should be thinking about when you are entering information that you think of as private onto a website or providing it to a company is, you know, both, is this something that it would be legal for them to share with people, but also, is it possible that someone might illegally gain access to this information? So, you know, in addition to thinking, do I think this company has good intentions? Um, you should also be thinking, do I trust this company has good enough security that this information isn't going to actually leak? that they're not gonna get hacked in spite of whatever good intentions they might have. And so let's take a look at a couple examples where um, maybe people shouldn't have trusted uh, these companies with our information. All right, so one of them is Equifax. Uh, so Equifax is a credit uh, agency. Uh, it's one of those companies that keeps track of what we do with our finance in the financial world and with our credit cards and whether or not we're credit worry, worthy. Um, and so they got breached and a lot of people had their names, their social security numbers, their birth dates and their addresses stolen in this breach. And in addition, some of them had their driver's license numbers uh, stolen. And it turns out that if you have a social security number and a driver's license, you create fake identities and create credit card accounts for people. So. Uh, that combination right there is super dangerous. Um, and just to kick some extra sand on to the people whose information was breached, 
Um, someone created a fake help website. Um, there was a real website for help called EquifaxSecurity2017.com. Somebody created one called SecurityEquifax2017.com, and it was close enough that Equifax accidentally tweeted the wrong website out on their Twitter account. Um, but the good news is, in this case, the fake website was created by a security expert to kind of make a point. Um, the other thing that's a little bit odd about the Equifax breach is none of us are customers of Equifax. We don't really agree for our information to be up there. Um, I mean, there might be something, some fine print in the credit card, uh, credit cards we sign up for, or maybe the banks we work with that says they're able to pass the information on Equifax, but none of us are directly customers of Equifax. And yet they had all this information and that information was all lost. Okay, here's another famous example, Ashley Madison. Um, if you're not familiar with Ashley Madison, that's probably a good thing. Ashley Madison was a dating website for adulterers and they got hacked. Um, and 9.7 gigabytes of data was taken, including members' names, addresses, phone numbers, birth dates, and sexual preferences. Um, one thing that the New York Times pointed out was that when uh, this information was released, it was entirely possible for the hackers to insert some fake data into it. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so people trusted Ashley Madison with their information. Um, they shouldn't have. Uh, perhaps Ashley Madison had good intentions, but uh, they did not have good computer security. All right, so our next example is Facebook. Over 50 million profiles on Facebook were, were taken and sold to Cambridge Analytica. Users were falsely told by a Cambridge professor that their data would only be used for academic purposes. Um, but not only was the data for those people who thought it was only going to be used for academic purposes taken, but it also turns out that uh, the professor involved was able to access information on their friends as well. Um, and so this is a little bit different than the previous examples because it wasn't that the company got hacked, but it was rather that they were working with somebody and that somebody violated the terms of agreement and did something that was dishonest. But, uh, you know, nevertheless, the people involved had their information taken and stolen and sold to, to a third party. Facebook was not technically hacked, but people sort of fell for what turned out to be kind of a, sort of a scam where uh, the person had intentions to uh, do something untrustworthy. You could argue that this is arguably a case of social engineering. In addition, uh, Facebook has had several occasions where they've had to fire employees because those employees were uh, cyber stalking people, taking advantage of their position at Facebook to cyber stalk. So these are both reminders that if you put information up there, even if the company has good intentions not to share that information in ways that uh, you, know, you, you might not want it shared, it is possible that bad things will happen and the information will leak anyway. All right, our uh, last example is the Office of Personnel Management. The Office of Personnel Management acts as a human resource department for the federal government. And among other things, it handles security clearances. And they got hacked. Information access included personnel files with names, addresses, birth dates, and social security numbers. Probably more troublesome, uh, it included background investigations for security clearances, which includes things like, you know, have you done drugs? Are there things that, you know, you've done that, that might lead to you being blackmailed? Um, so these are all the sorts of things that might go into background investigation and uh, it's going to be stored on their computers, which got hacked. Good job, guys. Um, in addition, digital images of fingerprints for government employees were also stolen. Now, as to who did the hack, it was probably China. The tool used uh, is associated with Chinese hackers. And in fact, a Chinese national has been charged with work related to one of the tools used in the Office of Personnel Management hack here. All right, um, let's move on to tools and techniques related to uh, privacy. So one technique that is used to breach privacy is something called a web beacon or a web bug. 
Uh, so these are used to track users on the internet and uh, you guys can figure out how these work because you know how HTML works and you know how HTTP works now. So essentially what a web bug or web beacon is, is it's a one by one image um, that appears on a web page. Uh, it's transparent so people don't actually notice that it's there. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as a tracking pixel. Um, and the idea here is this tracking pixel has a unique ID number, which identifies the specific individual who's uh, th this web page has been served up to. And this can be used for several different purposes. So one thing it can be used for is email tracking. So if you've got an invisible image on a uh, HTML mail file, uh, what happens is when somebody opens up that mail file, the HTML file has that IMG SRC equals, it's got uh, the name has that unique ID number for this particular email. And when the server gets hit by a request for that invisible tracking uh, pixel image, it says, oh, the person with that ID number just opened up the email message. That's why I'm getting a request for that particular tracking, uh, tracking image. Um, it can be used by businesses to see if somebody's read a particular email. Um, it can also be used by spammers to see if that an email address is active. So the spammers send out a bunch of emails uh, in HTML and all of the emails are exactly the same except for the tracking beacon. And so there's going to be an IMG SRC equals and then there's going to be a unique ID number dot JPEG or a unique ID number dot PNG. And now what's going to happen is when you go ahead and receive that email, um, if your email is set up to display images, your uh, web browser is going to, or your email program is going to send an HTTP request to wherever that tracking beacon is coming from. And it's going to send a request for the particular image file with that unique ID number that only you received in the email message. And then the server on the other side is going to see that that specific ID number was requested and it'll be able to match it up with the original email message that was sent. And you may have noticed that a lot of email programs have an option to not display images until you specifically say, oh, I trust the sender, go ahead and display the image now. And this is the main reason why they do that to prevent tracking of email. Um, these can also be used to track w people's movements across the internet. Um, with third-party cookies. And so when we're talking about a third party, what we're talking about is the first two parties are you and the website that you're visiting. So those are, that's party one and party two. And party three is some other party. Um, so the idea here is that uh, a website can allow a third party, um, such as an advertising network, to track a user's actions across multiple websites. And this can be either done with these tracking pixels that we were just talking about before, these invisible one by one pixel um, images, or they might actually be done with the visible advertisements. But what happens here is that when you visit a web page that is participating in this third party network with cookies, what will happen is in addition to the regular contents of that web page, you will also, um, the HTML file will also reference either that tracking pixel uh, web beacon image, or it will reference an actual advertisement that shows up on the web page. Either way, um, it is requesting that web beacon or that image file, not from their servers, but from the third party servers. When you make that request to the third party servers, what happens is um, that third party sends that image, whether it's the tracking beacon or an actual advertisement to you. And in addition, it places a cookie on your web browser. So cookie store are, is a technique used to store uh, small amounts of information um, in your web browser that can be uh, sent back to the website the next time you visit it. So. Like, let's say you go to Amazon. Uh, Amazon's going to put a little bit of information in your web browser such that the next time you visit Amazon, your web browser is going to send that information back to Amazon. And that's how Amazon actually knows who you are the next time you visit. 
Similarly, you know, if you've got subscriptions to things, they're like, you know, I have a subscription to the New York Times. The New York Times keeps track of me uh, by putting this little cookie on my web browser. And the next time I visit the New York Times, my web browser sends that cookie back to the New York Times when I visit and it says, oh, that's Patrick. Um, he has uh, academic access to the New York Times, so um, he's fine. Um, so the idea here is these third-party networks, because the HTML files have references to uh, images from these third-party servers, the third-party servers are able to send you tracking information and put this cookie information into your web browser. Now, when you move to a different website, if that website is also serving up images, again, whether they're these invisible web beacons or they're uh, visible advertisements, um, when that request to that third party, that advertising uh, server comes up, the third party cookie that they had put in previously is also gonna get sent to them. So they'll be like, oh, this is the same user. I saw this user on this other website. I'm now seeing them in this website and they can build up a picture of all the different sorts of websites that you visit. As long as you are visiting different websites on that tracking network, they will be able to build up all the information about all what your web browsing habits are and form a profile for you. Now, depending on what they wanna do, um, if you were to actually enter in information into one of these network websites, like let's say, you know, these advertisements were showing up uh, on a store web page, or maybe the store was working in conjunction with the advertising uh, network, even though uh, the store wasn't actually displaying images. Uh, and I enter in my name and phone number and other information, that information can be used in conjunction with the advertising network. If that website chooses to pass that information onto the advertising network, the advertising network not only has an idea of what my web browsing habits are, but potentially they could have my name, address, and phone number, and whatever other information I entered into uh, the main website that was working in conjunction with the tracking website. All right, so this doesn't sound very good. What can we do to protect our privacy? Well, last lecture we talked a little bit about, about VPNs, virtual private networks, and how um, they do provide some privacy. Uh, if you want to go further, there's something called Tor. Tor is a special routing system that is designed to let users remain anonymous on the internet. You can kind of think of it like a super-powered VPN with more protection, but it's much slower. Uh, Tor actually stands for the onion router, which refers to the multi-layered nature of the network it uses. When a user accesses a Tor server, their information is encrypted and passes through a series of Tor servers. And there are over 6,000 servers in the network. And so when you go ahead and access something through Tor, what's going to happen is um, you are going to get a special sequence through the Tor network where your information is going to get passed from one Tor server to another Tor server to another Tor server. Um, and when the information comes back, it should follow the same route uh, that information, that routing information is only good for 10 minutes. And if you make another access after the 10 minutes, you're going to get a different sequence of random servers. The intermediate Tor servers cannot see what the data is. Um, but ultimately, in order for you to access the regular internet, um, ultimately, on the far end, that information is going to have to be decrypted and the destination for your request needs to be discovered. Uh, and so the last Tor server is going to be able to have some idea of the information that you've sent. And so if you want your information to be completely hidden from the Tor server, you need to use encryption on top of just using Tor. So you could use something like HTTPS or secure email. Just be aware that by using Tor by itself, um, you are not fully encrypting your data. All right, let's talk about government uses of data and government concerns with privacy. So one thing that I've often joked about in class is that I really don't care if the NSA can read my emails. So, you know, the basic idea here is I do want to protect myself against random hackers, but 
if the NSA wants to break into my accounts, I am not claiming to have such good security that the NSA is not going to be able to break my stuff and read the emails I'm sending to my students. So just be aware of that on the emails I'm sending to you and the emails you're sending to me. All right. So should we be concerned about this? Should I be concerned about the fact that the U.S. government, maybe the NSA can actually break into my uh, accounts? Well, here's some things to think about. Online anonymity protects drug traffickers and terrorist organizations, and it also allows online harassment of individuals, often with no recourse on their side. On the other hand, anonymity also protects women's rights, gay rights, and human rights activists that operate in countries where they might face harassment or worse from the government. So I think it's a double-edged sword. Like, on the one hand, privacy can be used for really bad things, and on the other hand, privacy can be used for really good things. So it's not clear if there's a straight answer on this question. But ultimately, if you want to see what a government can do, if it wants to completely track all of its citizens, you can take a look at what's going on in China. So there's a couple of different things China is doing related to uh, privacy issues and leveraging uh, all the capabilities of modern computing. So one of the things they're working on is something called the Chinese social credit system. Um, according to the Washington Post, the Communist Party hopes to build a culture of sincerity in a harmonious socialist society where keeping trust is glorious. The ambition is to collect every scrap of information available online about Chinese companies and citizens in a single place and then assign each of them a score based on their political, commercial, social, and legal credit. The Atlantic describes the system as the system provides abundantly for sticks as well as carrots. Attend a subversive political meeting or religious service, for example, or frequent known haunts of vice or do under the table business with an unregistered informal enterprise. And the idea is that the network will know about it and respond by curtailing one's privileges. The state wants its citizens to believe that there's little point in trying to evade detection of such acts. According to the BBC, Eight Chinese companies are experimenting with state-sponsored social credit pilot programs. One of the program's social credit scores is used by, and in spite of having taken Chinese in college for a quarter, I'm afraid I can't pronounce Chinese, so I'm going to say bai hei, but that could be totally wrong. Sorry, guys. Uh, Chinese biggest matchmaking service. So the idea here is they're using the social credit score for matchmaking. Uh and again, quoting from the previous Washington Post article, um, and there are links to all these articles in uh, the class notes. According to the Washington Post, in one program in Sweeney County, citizens were given ratings from A to D. Citizens were classified into four levels. Those with an A grade qualified for government support when starting a business and preferential treatment when applying to join the party, government, or army, or applying for a promotion. People with a D grade were excluded from official support or employment. So basically, the Chinese government is taking all that information that we started off this lecture with saying, hey, because we're now in the digital world, um, it's super easy to track your movements. It's super easy to see what sort of uh, books you're reading, um, what sort of movies you're watching. Um, they can tell who you're talking to. They're, the Chinese government is taking all that information together and deciding how good of a citizen they think you are and how closely you are uh, at following, towing the party line. And on that basis, they're going to control your access to different resources, or they're going to try and punish you if you're stepping out of line. Um, another thing that they are doing is they're using closed circuit television cameras. Uh, the New York Times reports that the Chinese government has used facial recognition technology to track and control Uyghurs, a largely Muslim minority. Um, so if you're not familiar, the Uyghurs are the group that um, is literally being placed into camps, re-education camps, on the basis of their ethnicity and their religious beliefs. Uh, the system looks exclusively for Uyghurs based on their appearance and keeps records of their comings and goings for search and review. 
In addition, uh, the Chinese government is exporting this technology to other governments which are interested in also controlling their population. Um, so I find both of these rather disturbing. The Chinese government is also working on spyware on cell phones. Uh, and so there was an application that um, was being pushed by the Chinese government. And uh, some researchers went in and basically tried to study what this application was actually doing. And they discovered that the app included a backdoor giving an external user full super user access to the phone. Um, super user is essentially the operating system has different levels of protection, um, allowing different users different ability to access different things. And super user basically means the top level of user, the one that can do anything they want. Um, and this at level of access allows them to access the photos and videos, um, audio recordings on the phone, access to the user's context and internet activities. And in addition, it's able to retrieve information from 960 other applications, including shopping, travel, and messaging platforms. The app collects and sends detailed log reports every day containing a wealth of user data and app activity. And all members of the Communist Party were directed to download the app, as well as other companies and organizations were also pushing their members to uh, download this app. So bottom line, I think there's potentially a lot of bad things that can happen because of uh, what's going on and how we've moved to the digital world. And I think it behooves us all as citizens to keep track of what's going on and to try and push our government to limit what both the government itself and what companies can do. Because ultimately, when you move to see what a totalitarian government can do with all this information, it's actually pretty scary.